What I think is really interesting you've both sort of mentioned there is the John McDonnell, uh, Jeremy Corbyn Fisher. Uh, and that to me, I mean, we see this repeated in the book. I think it's really well documented, not just on the big issues like Brexit. Cause, you know, it was the big constitutional issue of our time. People are going to disagree on, on the Margaret Hodge disciplinary issue, on, on a bunch of things like that. And again, entirely entitled to disagree. But the fact that there were such public disagreements was quite new. And the genesis of that does seem to be uh, Salisbury. Uh, do you think that John McDonnell in 2018, did Salisbury trigger something in him? Uh, and why, why did he change? Because obviously we're, we're three years in now to the Corbyn project. He's not done this unt until now. I mean, wh why does he start to make these increasingly public interventions at odds with the leader's office? Um, it, it's a great question. And, you know, as ever in the wilderness of mirrors that is Labour, you'll get different answers depending on who you ask. Um, I mean, according to people who are close to Corbyn, um, you know, a number of people who are um, sympathetic to his stance on Salisbury, um, they say that um, Corbyn actually grew in confidence after the 2017 general election. Um, sure, him and John McDonnell are you know, friends and comrades, and I think they had actually expressly said they didn't want to mirror the TBGBs, the, the, row, the rows between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown over the new Labour years. Um, and yet, you know, Corbyn did grow in confidence after that surprising election result. And um, there are some who think that John McDonnell uh, basically couldn't deal with the fact that, um, you know, occasionally Corbyn would diverge from him and that ultimately what Corbyn wanted was what Corbyn got um, with, with, with respect to the party's position. Um, I mean, th that probably uh, is quite a kind of interpersonal analysis. Um, I think the kind of political issue at play was that the liberation struggle that you know, ultimately compelled John McDonnell was the liberation struggle, as we write, with the British working class. Um, he, he, he was a guy who was um, obsessed with power um, and you know, win, winning power in a country um, in order to uh, you know, bring, bring Britain to the left, change the way the country is run, democratise power um, and wealth. Whereas Corbyn you know, naturally always saw himself as the, uh, as the far left or the hard left, depending on what term you use. Uh, he, he saw himself as a left shadow foreign secretary um, and on issues such as foreign policy. Um, you know, for him, the notion you don't die on the hill of Russia or anti-Semitism um, would have felt quite unnatural, I think, because the whole point is that he spent his career dying on that hill. He was chair of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. He was a, you know, a, a, a torchbearer of the resistance to Iraq. Um, if the left has this moment... Um, moment of power, um, moment of influence, why, why, why not say we think about foreign policy? Um, we're not here to appease the Atlanticists, um, you, you know, the people who would have voted for airstrikes in Syria, the people who did vote for Iraq. Um, whereas I think John McDonnell's assessment was arguably more pragmatic. It was one of, well, listen, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can help the Palestinian people when we're in, when we're in office. But we're not going to get into office if we expend political capital and time um, on issues such as this. I mean, indeed, um, you know, after 2017, I think there was this um, th th there was this feeling that you know it's quite rare in politics you get to define the debate. And um, sure, you know, the majority of the time it's going to be the government or the media who set the terms um, of, of the discussion in the country at large. Um, what we have to do is we have to try to transcend that discussion, or we've got to move on from it quickly. Um, we're, we're not going to gain anything from being mired in the debate um, on, on Russia. And I think there was a lot of frustration because of that. I mean, I, I, I can entirely understand the sort of political analysis there. So you're saying that somebody like McDonnell just wants to neutralise contentious issues of foreign policy to focus on the, on the domestic agenda. But then that doesn't necessarily explain. So, for instance, he was saying that, you know, uh, members of the shadow cabinet shouldn't be going on Russia today. Um, that's not, you know, that's just not his decision. That is insubordination. That's not his decision to make. If he said it's my personal view, you know, but ultimately it's down to the to the leader or it's a collective decision for the shadow cabinet or whatever. But he didn't say that. You know, he was often freelancing, quite radical, not radical, but, you know, but ultimately it's got, you know, it's it's regulated by Ofcom. It's allowed to broadcast in Britain. It's quite a radical thing for a a, a British politician to say that doesn't mean anything. You know, I think if he said they, you know, their license should be reviewed or something, I mean, that's something else. So that, that in itself was quite significant. Then you've got, for instance, Margaret Hodge. Uh, and, and you actually, I think it's a nice, again, another vignette where you sort of clarify what happened. It wasn't necessarily as confrontation as people depict. But 
you know, him intervening there. And I, you know, for me personally, I think it's just a disciplinary issue. I'm, the older I get, the more I realize I quite like rules. You know, otherwise, this is the problem with sort of anarchist politics, as you sort of, everybody has to internalize all the rulemaking all the time. And I, some of my anarchist colleagues might get upset with me at Navarro Media. But, you know, we, we have rules for a reason, because otherwise we'd all, you know, we'd all go crazy. Uh, and I, Aaron, uh, law, law and order, Bastani. Yeah, well, no, I, and I just feel like, you know, if somebody's being disciplined, you know, that's, that's a matter for the disciplinary process. And I think the more senior your position, I say, and to be fair, Keir Starmer is a sort of politician who generally, that's the kind of thing he would... He would say he has a respect for due process. And so when I saw McDonald do that, the Campbell interview, uh, and of course the, the, the positioning on the, on the, on the second referendum, re regularly he would have Mandelson and Campbell go to his office. On the one hand, I think that's absolutely true. He was trying to neutralize the foreign policy issues. Uh, and Paul Mason says something similar. I think that's one of the things that Paul makes sense on actually in the, in the last couple of years. Um, Sipras did something similar. I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, but it does feel like the more you give these accounts of the relationship between Lotto and the Shadow Chancellor's office, it feels maybe there was a bit of jealousy there. I mean, that, that's how it strikes me. Either there was a bit of jealousy or not even necessarily jealousy. I'm the more talented politician. I know what's right, uh, rather than necessarily saying, well, I think I know what's right, but ultimately I have to defer to this guy because he is the leader. And it, it feels like McDonnell lost that towards the end, increasing over 2018, 2019. <laughs> Well, that's that's certainly what uh, people close to Jeremy Corbyn would characterise it as. That sort of, you know, John, uh, you know, there's Carrie Murphy herself has said on the record um, and says in the epilogue of the book that the coup, which we'll get onto later, that the, the putsch in Corbyn's office that Carrie Murphy later engineered, uh, no, sorry, John McDonnell engineered against Carrie Murphy and, and not quite against Seamus Mill. Carrie Murphy suspects um, was driven by John McDonnell's feeling that he couldn't. Uh, influence Corbyn as much as he felt he was entitled to. Because uh, Gable mentioned t uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown before, perhaps a better analogy here uh, is George Osborne and David Cameron, right? Corbyn and McDonnell were partners in an ideological project, just as Cameron and Osborne were. You know, people used to refer to Cameron and Osborne sort of as a joint premiership, with one person as the front man, the other as the sort of m and Greece. And I'd say that's probably a fair assessment of what people in Lotto, what people very close to Corbyn, think John McDonald's perception of Corbyn and McDonald's relationship was. So as Gabriel said, and as, as, as you correctly say, as that starts to diverge, it's no wonder people like Carrie Murphy say, well, obviously this is explained by John loses control. Um, and part of, I think that's, that's also part of, partly an explanation for why you have him saying, oh, I'm going to vote remain in this referendum or we're banning RT. Um, and frequently he'd be asked, why are you saying this when Jeremy Corbyn doesn't think it? Um, I think a good way of, you know, you can explain it one of two ways. One is that McDonald realised that public pressure or electoral pressure would push them to that position anyway. And it would be less painful for Corbyn to make that move if he'd already broken the ground. You know, a phrase I used to use, you know, he's like Jeremy Corbyn's navvy. He does the sort of backbreaking work of breaking the hard political ground and Corbyn sails through. Um, or... I think if your people close to Corbyn think, well, he's doing that, so we're hostages to fortune. We're doing that, so we have to follow John McDonnell down the road. Um, and obviously, you know, we can't see into the inside of John McDonnell's head. Um, but I'd say that, that, that both of those explanations carry some weight. You would, you would think, because he's he's a, he's an extraordinarily talented politician. I think most people would agree. I mean, I, I, it's asserted in the book, and I, you know, I would certainly agree with it. That John is the most talented sort of left wing politician of his generation. And it reminds me of there was the anecdote from Barack Obama in, I think, 2008. He said, you know, I, I would be a better speechwriter than my speechwriters. I would be a better policy advisor than my policy advisors. Um, and, and it feels like John McDonnell maybe felt that was him. Um, it's a bit like Barack Obama being a number two, running as a VP, perhaps, in 2008. I'm, I'm the one that's got the most to offer here. I guess, when do you think that became toxic because it feels like it became toxic in this kind of rivalry ultimately between McDonald's office and, and, and Corbyn's office by early 2019 was was there a particular moment where as you say this culminates in, in, in John McDonald amongst others saying we need a complete reconfiguration of the leader's office so I mean to answer that question I just want to briefly go back to the circumstances of Corbyn's uh, initial leadership victory in 2015 um, I think part of understanding John McDonald's approach to the way that Lotto was run lies in the fact that 
and you know, na- naturally, this won't be new to anybody that watches this channel. That you know, Corbyn did not expect to win. Um, he threw his hat into the ring because Diane Abbott had done it before. John McDonnell had does it had done it as well. We hear a lot about the phrase. It was his turn. Um, and you know, there are some, including those close to Corbyn, who say that it wasn't incidental that Corbyn won. You know, naturally, uh, McDonnell, McDonnell couldn't have won um, because the PLP thought he was swivel-eyed, nasty, Trotskyist, whereas Corbyn was kind of avuncular and cuddly and harmless. Um, you know, there, there are those close to Corbyn who say that nobody could have, um, you know, that n- nobody was as much of an anti-politician as him and therefore nobody could have inspired that kind of enthusiasm and sincerity from the grassroots. Um, but nevertheless, you do have this feeling that emanates from people who are close to, M- to McDonnell who, who echo the fact that, well, yeah, it was his turn, but we were, we were both marginalized over the decades um we've both been fighting a long lonely fight um there's nothing kind of unique or exceptional um to corbyn other than happen to win but we should you know jointly be the architects or kind of co co conveners of this i mean as you say over time it becomes clear that that's just not how the project is run um i think probably the key point at which this becomes you use the word toxic is the summer of 2018 because Basically, you know, McDonald took to telling people that if only they'd had one last week, if, if, if the 2017 election campaign had lasted for seven, seven more days, uh, they could have won based on where uh, the polls were going at that time. Um, they were agonizingly close to power. They were literally talking about what Corbyn's number 10 might look like in the days running up to the poll and possibility of bringing an unaccompanied migrant or refugee into Corbyn's Downing Street um, or redecorating the number 10 Rose Garden. You know, they could, they could taste power. And so the summer after that, 2018, was about a big, a big summer of pushing forward, making inroads into the Red Wall, um, extending Labour's reach in kind of cosmopolitan areas where they'd done better than expected in 2017. And what did it become about instead? They were debating the accompanying examples of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And I think that just inspired a fury um, from within, I mean, it's not just John McDonnell. A lot of people were furious that they wasted this moment. I mean, h- how how can that happen? Um, you know, the, the, the left is in touching distance of power, and you then spend a summer, um, you know, answering questions about whether you're a Zionist or um, whether you think that Zionism and being pro-Palestine are mutually exclusive. Um, will Margaret Hall um, be expelled or suspended or not? I mean, it was just a waste of time. And I think there was so much frustration towards Lotto because of that. And I think with Brexit, it then never really recovered. 